live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Q, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Hi everybody, welcome to MIT IQ. We are in Cambridge, Mass. This is the Cube. SiliconANGLE Wikibon's continuous coverage of MIT IQ, which is MIT's Chief Data Officer Conference. Mikola Havanovich is here. He's the Director of Data Science at Intel. Mikola, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Good to see you. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me and having me. So your role at Intel, uh, you know, relatively new, new terminology thrown around. I mean, data science could be argued has been around for a long time, but mm -hmm. you're increasingly seeing that title uh, take shape, certainly over the last you know, three, four, five years. How, how did it come about at, at Intel? So I think, uh, generally speaking, uh, the role of a data scientist, uh, it, it was about to happen, right? Um, in terms of uh, Intel, uh, so a lot of people think that Intel is just a hardware company, but it's not so. We've been in software for a number of years, and uh, from um, anything from, uh, uh, you know, making investments and developments of open source Linux at the beginning of 2000, and then around 2005, 2006, when the virtual environment, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtualizing environment came, came about, and Intel made a significant investment in the uh, VMware and their line of hypervisor products. Uh, and then around 2009, uh, we saw, sh uh, you know, uh, a move to the cloud, and if you know it, the uh, last year we made a significant investment in the Cloudera and Hadoop, right? and we believe that uh, Hadoop is going to, uh, it's a major inflection point, it's going to dwarf all the previous inflection points, uh, because uh, we believe that Hadoop's ability to ingest uh, these heterogeneous types of data sources, structured, unstructured, semi-structured, and its increased ability to uh, analyze uh, effectively these data sources will continue changing uh, business uh, and how it's done. So no. what does a data scientist do at, at Intel? You, would, you, you, you analyze data, obviously, but talk more about you know, how you apply that. So uh, our organization, uh, we are a customer-facing uh, organization, uh, right? We are part of the data center group, and uh, there are, uh, we work in a number of verticals, right? So we have uh, a number of different, uh, uh, our team uh, works in a number of different, uh, for different organizations. And uh, some of the, we, we do a lot of interesting work. Anything from the healthcare and life sciences arena, FSI, uh, manufacturing, you name it, right? Some of the interesting use cases, and uh, as a matter of fact, I'll be giving a talk later this afternoon. Uh, one of them is actually from healthcare and life sciences arena, and it's about predicting readmissions uh, for the healthcare providers, right? Uh, and uh, a lot of the hospitals are interested in doing that because, for example, if the patient gets uh, treated for a specific condition, right, let's say pneumonia, and then uh, 30 days later gets released, to the hos uh, gets, gets released from the hospital and 30 days later gets back to the same hospital for the same condition, obviously something went wrong and the condition wasn't treated properly the first time. It's called the readmissions, right? And if that happens, the hospital doesn't get reimbursed uh, for the second, nor sec if neither for the first nor second visit which is a really, uh, has significant financial well, implications, yeah. right? So a lot of the healthcare providers really looking for the new ways of improving uh, their quality of service, providing the right type of service to the patients in order to reduce these type of uh, conditions. So we have developed a set of advanced analytics uh, analyzing their different uh, uh, data sources, internal, as well as we brought in a number of external data sources uh, to enrich uh, the data sources that they had internally to build an analytical model to help them predict and prevent the readmissions. When you think of companies that are traditionally in the, you know, the short list of players, major players in the Hadoop market, Intel is usually not among them, your investment in Cloudera aside, why should Intel be on that list or how should people think of, of Intel mm -hmm. when it comes to Hadoop in this inflection point you're talking about? Okay. So, I think that Intel is constantly earning its right to be a trusted advisor in the market. Right? So when we deal with our customers, uh, we often build a relationship in order to establish ourselves as a trusted advisor. And additionally, we are trying to be market leaders in developing uh, new types of technologies and driving the market 
uh, towards these taking letting the market take advantage of these new technologies that arise so I think that's um, I hope uh, that answers your question, right? Um, well, well, are there certain technologies you can point to, uh, open source technologies perhaps, where Intel has been a major a part of that development effort? Yes, absolutely. So, um, during our investment into the Cloudera, um, we have developed uh, a number of security-based um, uh, features for Hadoop that were now integrated into the roadmap of the Cloudera. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is called Project Rhino which enables a cell level security uh, access controls for HBase, which is a database for Hadoop. Right, so this is something that uh, that's, uh, was developed by Intel. And uh, by the way, Intel, everything that we do, uh, we put into the open source. We are 100% open source, right? So uh, Project Rhino is an open source product and uh, anybody can take advantage of it. And Cloudera has integrated that into their roadmap. In addition to that, we do a lot of things on the um, uh, on the hardware level to make sure that the processes that underpin Hadoop performance run best on Intel architecture. So you think about, you mentioned cell level security and HBase, so I, I, I can't help but think of Accumulo. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yes, I am. Okay, so mm -hmm. so uh, help, help us understand sort of how those fit together. You have multiple open source projects, is it just sort of put it out there, can Accumulo utilize some of the the Rhino technology can 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 HBase utilize some of the Accumulo. Mm. How does that all sort of fit together? So um, Accumulo and uh, Squirrel uh, company, local company here, right, right, right. Uh, they um, that's their own separate product, right? Uh, that they are uh, going after and they are developing and supporting uh, HBase. Uh, it's a part of the standard distribution of Cloudera. If you look at the Horton works, you know, they use HBase, they don't use Accumulo. You can use Accumulo on top of uh, those distributions if you choose to, but they're not, uh, it's usually not the part of standard distribution, right? And the same thing for Cloudera. They have HBase as their default standard um, database, um, kind of key value store database that they support. But if you decide to run Accumulo on top of it, nobody will prevent you. The capabilities of uh, provided by Rhino are similar in terms of cell level security as those that are provided by Accumulo, uh, but they are for HBase, and uh, HBase being a standard portion of the distribution of Hadoop for, from these uh, major providers of Hadoop, is, uh, that's the value. So how, how, how does this all roll up to a business for Intel? So they don't think of software, I mean is software just a, a, a big part of your business that is not commonly talked about? Or does this come back somehow to the hardware that the company designs to support these, these kinds of technologies? Very good question. So at the end of the day, it does come, uh, so first of all, it, it's all about the customer's experience, right? So we do want the customer, enable our customers from a variety of perspectives. Uh, from the business case, uh, of course, uh, we are looking for all of these things to run on Intel hardware and Intel uh, architecture. So it, uh, we're driving these major markets and the adoption of these major markets, right, of you know, big data market is multi, multi-billion dollar market, right, and it continues growing. So uh, by enabling customers and the adoption of these, uh, of these technologies, our hope is, of course, that it will run on Intel architecture. So, without asking you to pre-announce products, uh, can you speak to how these might uh, manifest themselves in Intel chips in the future? Uh, you're talking the hardware? Well, uh, thing, things like Hadoop, li like uh, uh, optimizing Hadoop, or okay. like secure Hadoop, course, uh, course, uh, uh, securing Hadoop. Okay, thank you. So, uh, yes, there are a number of uh, things that we are doing. Uh, one of them is uh, specialized uh, so essentially what we're trying to do uh, in these cases, we're trying to do, push all these uh, very intensive jobs um, that are typical of Hadoop, uh, the I.O., the encryption, decryption, and other things, heavy analytical cycles, down to the silicon. Uh, to give you an example, um, um, there is an instruction, there is a component of the standard part of the chip right now that Intel has, which is a set instruction set called ESNI, that allows you to do the encryption much, much faster, right? M to do it on the uh, silicon level instead of the application level. And to give you some numbers for comparison, if you were to do this uh, on, um, in the application layer, you could suffer, if you were to do the encryption, decryption of the data as it's coming in, right, and, and into your environment, 
uh, you could suffer anywhere from 8 to 12 percent penalty. If you do this in silicon, it's probably between 1 and 3 percent, which is a much easier uh, thing to accept as an organization to keep you safe, right? That's not going to uh, hinder uh, your, usually it's not going to hinder your uh, production process. What's Intel's perspective on, or your pers personal perspective on, on Spark? Um, you know, Duke, known for batch, a lot of people talk about how, you know, Google and others, well, obviously MapReduce inside of Google, mm -hmm is sort of old news now, they've moved to Spark, even that Spark being old news now, or you know, in memory type of technologies. Right. What's your thoughts on Spark, its you know, ability to, to change sort of that nature of Hadoop from batch to mm -hmm. near real time? So, no, I think, I mean, obviously it's extremely useful, right? Uh, you do eliminate this unnecessary need in many cases to um, between mapper and reducer to write data back to, to the disk and then read it back from the disk for the reducer, right? That's, that's an unnecessary bottleneck. Anytime you hit a hard drive, uh, that's a problem, right? So uh, from that perspective, Spark is extremely useful. So is this in-memory kind of distributed processing is extremely useful. One thing that I can say, and this kind of goes back to the previous question from the hardware perspective, what Intel is also is developed is and developing um, is this capability of using solid state drives to complement main memory. So imagine instead of having, you know, 256, uh, you know, you know, gigabytes of uh, RAM. Now you have, you know, um, you know, a terabyte of uh, main memory. That means that your Spark processes can fully run in the main memory. So, and to add to that. Of course, the SSDs are never going to be as close, uh, I mean, they're not going to be as fast as the main memory. But they're persistent. However, they're going to come very, very close because they're going to sit in the express PCI, PCI slot. So right. that's, that's, that's and, definitely And they're persistent. Right? Of course, so. yeah. Our Intel got out of the memory business many years ago. Is there, are you saying that you So get now back we're, we're coming back. We have our Intel brand of uh, solid state drives and a technology which allows to use these solid state drives to expand your main memory um, to, you know, is this technology you're somebody's. building yourself, or are you, repair, are you are you outsourcing this to to other companies? Well, that part, uh, this is something we're building ourselves, and obviously, probably in collaboration with some other parties. Mm -hmm. I mean, Intel's, you know, your approach has always been to create standards, mm -hmm. um, promulgate those standards throughout the industry, and let and let the whole thing grow, and then mm -hmm. you sell your technology I into that. I presume that's similar roadmap or playbook for this initiative. This sort of SSD is memory extension. Right, I think this is a very natural and very useful initiative, right? Because as you want to do more in-memory types of analytics and bring the capability to Hadoop, uh, well, nothing is really truly real-time. Things are pseudo-real-time or near real-time. But, uh, but in order to be able to do that, there are certain steps that you need to take, right? So, and allowing people to have these large amounts of main memory to support their Spire processes or Flink processes, right? That is very crucial in the, in the future. A lot of talk about Moore's Law in the industry. People say, oh, Moore's Law, for years they've been saying Moore's Law, it's coming to an end, mm -hmm. Moore's Law is dead. Uh, but I think the industry generally has underestimated human innovation <laughs> and ability to do things, whether it's you know, cores or however, you know, the the, the basic concept of mm -hmm. you know doubling performance every 18 months, um, you know, has been achieved. So, wh what do you say? What's the scuttlebutt inside Intel when somebody you know you see an article in Wired magazine, you know, Moore's Law is coming to an end, or other prominent people, or your competitors now? Of course, IBM doesn't sell x86 anymore, so they're happy to sort of you know talk about that. What's Intel's take? So we are believers in, in the Moore's Law. Uh, there are, of course, so I think there is, as you mentioned yourself, there, in terms of uh, never un underestimate the innovation and the, you know, uh, the brilliance of people. Uh, I think they will be able to come up with new ways, right? Even if the typical ways of, let's say, you know, physics, you know, if you go from a, you know, lower, you know, than a nanometer, you know, mm -hmm. into kind of, there are some physical constraints there that you cannot avoid. But uh, given that, there may be some other opportunities that we will be exploring in order to address that and keep doubling the performance and keep growing the, the power to support the, 
the overgrowing demand of doing things faster on more data and. Uh, I mean, yeah. Intel's marched to the cadence of Moore's law for you know, m many decades, and it's driven innovation in the industry. You're increasingly investing in software. Is there a software analog to Moore's law? Well, from the data perspective, it sure is, right? The data keeps growing exponentially. Of course, unless there's a World War II, then all bets are off, but until then, the data will keep growing. I think uh, one aspect of the, the data and the way the data is growing, right? We all know that people describe uh, big data from the perspective of three Vs, right? Volume, velocity, variety. I mean, some people add some other Vs, but one important V gets often left out. It's the value, right? Because even though the volume of the data keeps growing exponentially from year to year and so on, the value present in that data, unfortunately, doesn't grow exponentially. So you are facing the situations where you have to compute and go through more and more data much faster, right? So that's, uh, in a way, something that you have to live up to if you want to uh, continuously maintain your competitive edge for the business or your organization. So Hadoop is sort of this filter, Bitbucket uh, filtering mechanism, if you will. Does, does Spark need Hadoop more, or does Hadoop need Spark? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. I think um, they both complement each other really well, right? You need distributed storage and you need distributed compute somehow, right? So you need to, and you need to have them uh, side by side in order to, to do things quickly, right? You want to bring your compute to the data, not the data to compute. So you want them to be together, right? So from that perspective, I think they, it's an equal partnership. But then let's not forget, I, I've heard people say that Flink is going to do to uh, Spark what Spark did to Map MapReduce, so who knows? You, you are a real live data scientist, and we're hearing, uh, a lot of companies are hearing that they should hire data scientists right now. Uh, on the other hand, there are those who say that data scientists will become obsolete eventually, that, 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 that software will essentially make, uh, will do the, the, the work that you do now for the end user. What's your perspective on that? Mm. Okay, so in my vision, and also uh, this is part of Intel's vision, you do need the right type of big data platform to analyze this, you know, these uh, troves, humongous troves of data that uh, that arrive, right, and that you have, right. And in order to do that, you need the right type of uh, platform built, right. We see the four key layers of that platform. The first layer is your infrastructure layer, unsurprisingly, that right. This is your networking, storage, and compute. And this is a very important layer because later on, if you're doing analytics, let's say, on your data that run in iterative fashion, and during each iteration, most if not all of your data sieves through the network, you better have a good network backbone to support that. Now, the layer on top of that is actually where you store the data, right? That's where you bring the data, integrate it, uh, munge it, perform, you know, make it available for the analysis, right? Now. And after that, once the data is readily available for the analysis, you need the right set of tools in order to take advantage of, uh, of that data. But not only that, you need the right type of context, right? So you take these analytics or algorithms, you need to, you need to have the right context to apply these analytics uh, to the right types of data and execute it, right? So when it comes, so if, you know, in several years, uh, they don't call us data scientists, but they call us something else. There still will be a need for the person who will know how to, which algorithm to take in, w in this specific context and how to apply it to, this, to these types of data to get the value to the organization. So I do believe that the data scientist uh, role will continue to exist, even if it gets renamed. Well, whatever they call you. Uh, according to Hal Varian, they'll call you sexy, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. But uh, how, how do you see it evolving? I mean, as you, as, as you, do you move up the stack, essentially, does a data scientist become more of a, of a strategist over time and less of a technologist, or how does that evolve? Well, I mean, it depends uh, on the definition. Uh, there are some key things that the data scientist needs to possess. So the context of the business uh, that you do your analysis in is obviously very important. Uh, but also your kind of back background knowledge, right? So the machine learning, data mining, graph analytics, um, some statistics probability, and kind of just uh, open-minded, right? So you don't function, quite often you have to be uh, unconventional and function outside of the box, right? So this is, not about doing different things, doing things differently, right? So you have to be innovative and always come up with new ideas. 
so um, from from that perspective, I think uh, you know that's obviously an important uh, quality to have. So that's I think these different components. When somebody is looking for a data scientist, right, um, that those are something that you need to know. Now, I you know a lot of organizations fear that the data scientists are not being um, let's say readily available or there is a lack of us or something like that and the truth be told I think it's the same as with any other pr profession right there are a lot of um, doctors but to find a good one is challenging however these um, so for data scientists uh, I think it's some, somewhat similar right as for any other profession uh, the the education you know the university and the educational institutions they keep producing and they have been producing people with expertise in machine learning data mining graph theory statistics probability right all the applied math uh, type of areas so that hasn't changed um, I think uh, the key part is uh, this uh, context the knowledge of the domain that you're working on that comes with experience so so that's a, that's a great point so so what are some questions that a, a, that a company who's looking to hire data scientists should be asking itself before they go out looking for people like you hmm. well I think uh, it depends on the company right it's not an easy question to answer right uh, as I described uh, obviously the domain is important like what do you want to right. do what do you want to accomplish but what, what are some other questions that come to mind? so if they are technically astute if they are willing to learn um, um, I would say that I've seen uh, data scientists who don't think right off that they have the answer to the problem and have this kind of more open um, more agile mindset do better than the people who think that okay, I'm just going to fit this template to every every problem, right? So I've seen that work better. Um, but other than that, I think there are a lot of you know kind of standard procedures that you still follow. Does it does this individual fit into the kind of um, the culture of the organization and the you know uh, and other other standard things? But from the technological uh, from the kind of technical perspective, I think it's machine learning, data mining graph theory, uh, those type of areas are key to have. Yeah, just quick, I mean, you, you've got your PhD is in machine learning, mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, something that I think is not well understood by many people, what machine learning is. Can you d define it? What do we need to know about machine learning? Okay, so um, I think there are a couple of portions, right? So you have your data mining and machine learning, and simply speaking, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, I guess the bulk of uh, the work that's been done in these two areas is around uh, either analyzing and exploring the data, and that's more on the side of data mining, right? All your kind of exploratory um, uh, functions and algorithms to help you understand the data the, the, and things like that, right? From machine learning, you try to identify specific patterns or specific things. You try to learn uh, certain things that are present in the data in order to be able to predict in the future if something is going to work out one way or not, right? So. I think uh, it's all about learning patterns and understanding uh, patterns. All right, so we have to leave it there. We're uh, up against the break. Uh, Mikola, thanks very much for, for coming to theCUBE. My last question, though, is um, your role here at the mm -hmm. MIT CDO IQ. What, uh, what's your take? You're giving a talk this afternoon. Mm -hmm. You know, What's your impression of what's going on here? So far, it's a great event. Uh, this is my second time um, attending this, uh, this event, so I'm really happy to be here. It seems uh, really enjoyed the keynote speaker this morning. Uh, very interesting uh, mm. uh, body of work that he presented, so I was really impressed by that. And overall, I think we have really great audience, great attendees, and uh, I look forward to the rest of this event. That's great. Well, thanks to you for coming on the Cube. Really appreciate your time and, and your insights. All right, keep right there, everybody. We'll Thank be you back much. with our next guest right after this. This is the Cube. We're live from MIT IQ, MIT CDO IQ in Cambridge. We'll be right back. <laughs>